Good morning. We're live Sunday morning. Welcome to our household talk. We are live on Zoom and Facebook. We are free on both, on either. We are thankful that you can join us. We are, we are happy to have you. It's a Sunday morning and I know the, the temperature is getting uh, high. Many of your places I know are very hot, even where my where I am in Mansa, temperatures are beginning to soar. So you, you are all welcome, folks. If you're having challenges on Zoom, you can also join us on, on Facebook. We are live, but either way. But thank you for joining us. Thank you. Recording in progress. Uh, we are happy to have you. So this is a, a, a household talk where we meet every Sunday to discuss truth, to discuss our, our humanity, to discuss who we are. So you, you are all welcome. For Facebook family, please, whenever you log in, try and tag some people, try and share, share the link with some people. These are very important lessons, folks. You won't regret, I'm telling you. Please share, Zoom, Zoom, folks. Zoom family, thank you very much. Moabe, someone was trying to log in with Zoom. I think they are, they are failing. They went out. I saw someone there. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so I've just put up a uh, notice to say those having challenges uh, about uh, they can still go join via Facebook. Yes, I think so. So if you know them, you can just text them. So that they try Oh. If you can see the the Facebook link, you can share it with them. So thank you very much. Please feel relaxed. You're welcome. Let's have a good time. We always meet here. I know sometimes te technology has its hiccups, but we're supposed to be between 9.30 and 11 hours. But that being the case, we still, we still are going to have a very good time today. I promise you, I want you to relax. I want you to have an open mind. I want you to come with an empty cup so that you can draw from this water. This is a household talk for every person, every human being. It's not a religious talk. It's not a, a, any other human organization talk, but it's a talk for every human being, every humanity, all the billions of people. This is a very important message. So I'm stalling a bit because I want you guys to share, to share with someone in the beginning. So we've been having great times, wonderful times, and I, I would love to welcome my host, Mam Lumbuka. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. How is, how is your Sunday? How is Lusaka? Masa is hot. Yeah, Lusaka is hot. It's quite hot, but it's okay. All right. So you, you think we're going to have a good time today? You think we're going to have a wonderful time today? Yes, we will. We will. We definitely right. do. Okay. I think we can start. I think most of the people have joined and Zoom what is taking care of that. Thank you, folks. You again, you're welcome. You can reach us on YouTube. These lessons are always recorded on YouTube and on Facebook, and they will be forever be there. And when you go to YouTube and Facebook, please don't forget to like and hit the subscribe button. Because when you subscribe, every Sunday, a new video is done, new lesson is done, it will reach you. So please don't forget to share with your friends. I want to appreciate you, all, like always, for always being here every Sunday. This is going to help you. Just relax, feel free, come with an open mind, don't come with a closed up mind. I want to tell you something today. I want to talk to you, if you can allow me. So I'll be very slow, attentive as usual, because God has given us the word and he has asked us to, to go and tell it to the world. He's chosen us to go to all the nations and talk about these issues, which man has overlooked, which 
man has overlooked. And remember, the past Sundays, we noticed that when, when we overlook these issues, there are dire consequences. Because God or truth or nature is not a respecter of persons. And folks, even as you come here, that's why I say oh, be, be of an open mind, relax. We are not here to, to force you into anything. We are not here to, to tell you things that you don't want to hear. This message is to them who have an ear to hear. I've got, you know, every time I know, I'm in this world wide, in this world wide, wide world, I have a student somewhere among the people who are listening. Even if it's one, there is a student who is going to propagate this truth because this truth must be sustained. If our generation cannot hear it, the next generation should. Because, you know, if we don't hear it and, we, and if we lose it, man will live in dire pain for the rest of his life here on earth. So what I'm saying is that you don't force people to confess. We don't force people to confess. We don't force people to hear this message. But we admonish and encourage because folks just try it and listen to what we're saying today. I've got something to tell you. I want to talk to you. So you do you do any anything you do anytime anytime you you are you are sharing your your understanding to people you don't force them to confess. So we don't force people to confess here. There's no compulsion in religion. They should not because that's why religion is dirty because there's compulsion. But folks, there should be no compulsion in religion. If people are afraid of you, it's because they hate you. So you can, you 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 instill fear on people, and you come you force them to believe your religion. Like I'm saying, there's no compassion in religion, folks. If people are afraid of you, it's because they hate you. It's not because they respect you. So what we do, what I do, what I've been doing for the past over 20 years, nearly 30 years of talking to the world like this is whatever we do is giving up ourselves to the service of man. This will have been said. Your whole duty as man is to give up yourself to the service of man. Because, you know, sometimes, remember truth, like we are saying, truth, which is the word, is God itself. And you know, when the word is in the world and you misuse it, it, uh, remember, we mentioned that uh, that is tantamount to blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. In fact, that's what blasphemy of the Holy Ghost means. In the book of uh, Matthew, Matthew 12, 31, Matthew 12, 31, and just uh, for, for all of us, just to know that uh, we have uh, a, 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 a bereavement in the world family. Sister Pam Goodwin in the United States of America, one of our family friends, our family, Mam Lumbuka and I, my co-host, we had a, a chance to see her last August. She traveled to Zambia with her husband to visit. Even when she was sick, she was actually awaiting an operation of the heart. She still came in pain. We could see her even when we had those talks. Mam Lumbuka had about two hours talks with her. And she has a lot of her, herself, a lot of her in her. They had a good conversation and they conferred on many things. But you could tell that even when she was around, she was in pain, she was sick. So sadly, folks, I think we lost her. Was it yesterday or the other day, Mama uh, Two days ago. Yeah, two days ago. We lost her. She succumbed to the heart problem. So. You can say a little prayer for her. I know most of you might not know her, but she's very dear to us. We, 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 we know her. I know my wife, my wife, who is my co-host, became so fond of, of her. They were fond of each other. They loved each other. So it affects us. We are praying for them. So anyhow, so I was saying there's no com compulsion in religion. You don't compel people. What we do is giving up ourselves to the service of man. And you know, we are always blaspheming the Holy Ghost. You see, Matthew 12, 31 says, Wherefore I say unto you, Jesus, Jesus' words, 
Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Listen to me, folks. I said I wanted to talk to you today. So give me your ear. Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is when the Son of Man is reciting the word. The Son of Man is reciting the word of God to you. When the Son of Man is reciting the word of God to you. Remember who is the Son of Man? The man who has been entrusted by the word, with the word of God by God. Just like Ezekiel was called Son of Man. Eat the scroll. So when the Son of Man is reciting the word of God in their true interpretation. You know, you need to interpret the word, the word of God, not just interpreting them, but in their true interpretation. So when the Son of Man, so blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is when the Son of Man is reciting the word of God in their true interpretation, and you blaspheme those words. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Because the word, remember, the word is, is, is what is called God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The Word is the Father, folks. The Word is the Father. The Word is the Holy Ghost. The Word is the Son. And these three are one. I hope you understand what I'm saying. The Word is, is, is one thing, but we can explain it in those ways. It fathers us. It's, it's the Holy Ghost because it's, it's whole, but we cannot see it. The Word. We cannot... We can only hear it on the, on the tongue of a man. It's the S-U-N of God. S-U, son there, is S-U-N. The, the, the Romans, when they, when they started understand, trying to understand the truth, they replaced S-U-N with S-O-N. Or, although these two words are interchangeable sometimes. It's S-U-N, as in Malachi 2, 4. Unto you that fear my name shall the S-U-N of God appear with healing in his ways. The word, the truth. So today, folks, without further ado, I know most of you have uh, shared this link. Please share. I want us to talk about the temple of God. I, I promise you that now we'll be doing like an organized, uh, an organized structured lesson every Sunday, so that I don't lose you. Because I know before I was just giving you different snapshots of what we talk about here. I want to talk about the temple of God. In fact, we'll be discussing the temple of God and what its allegory is, how it, it affects us in our lives, how it interprets a lot of uh, issues in our lives. So in understanding the temple of God, I know when you go to Exodus 28, you read how, it was, how God gave the instructions to them of old to build it, how they were to use what wood, how they were to use what stone, they were to use the hewn stone, the, the stone they went to hewn from the mountains by the muscles. And this hewn stone was, not, was supposed to be broken in the mountain. And when it was brought at the side of the temple, it was just supposed to be fitting in without a hammer head at the temple. All those things are figurative, you see. Uh, so maybe just to summarize what that temple was. Paul summarizes that, that for us in the in the book of Hebrews 9, verse 8. But these are, are household talks, and we, and we are studying truth. So you will do well most of the time after you go back to your Bible. You know, I I come to, to confirm the truth. I come to guide you into truth. So using these pathways and openings I give you, you can go back then and study the word of God the way it's supposed to be understood. So at your own time, family, you can read Exodus 28. But I'm going to summarize it using Hebrews 9.1, the way Paul summarized it in a, in a short, in a, in a sum up. All right, Hebrews 9.11, I'm sorry, Hebrews 9 verse 1, the Bible reads, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and the worldly sanctuary. Verse 2, for there was a tabernacle made first. There was a tabernacle made, like uh, Hebrews 2 9. For there was a tabernacle first made, rather. The first where it was the candlestick. In the, in the tabernacle, you would find the candlestick and the table and the showbread. 
which was this was called the the sunshine. Are we following one another? Let's summarize the temple so that when I begin to explain this allegory, it becomes easier. So again, let me repeat that again. There's two. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick. So when you went into the tabernacle, you found the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. That place was called the sanctuary. It was the sanctuary. Verse 3, and after the second veil, in the sanctuary, there was a veil, there was a cloth. So after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which we sometimes call the holy of holies in our own coined language. But in the Bible, there's no word holy of holies. It's just the holiest of the holy place. So in there, you notice in the first room, which is called the holy place or the sanctuary, there was a candlestick, there was a table, and, the, and, and there was a showbread. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. There's four, which are the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid around about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So, verse 5, and over it was the cherubim of glory shadowing the mysticism of which we can now, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Because people didn't understand that that was not historical but allegorical. So Paul says we could not uh, understand as humans what that meant. Six, now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle. See, the priest went in the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. The seven, but into the second, the holy of holies, into the second, went the high priest alone once every year not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. In the Holy of Holies, he only went there once a year. I'll explain what, where I'm going to. I want you to understand the, the, the temple as it was physically. Then I will explain my lesson today. Verse 8. So, he says, seven, but into the second, which is the Holy of Holies, the priest went there once a year. Every, the, the priest went, the high priest alone, went there alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet manifest. While as the first tab number was yet, yet uh, standing. So Paul is saying the Holy Ghost, which is the way, the truth has not yet been understood, what the significance was which I want to show you to today, verse 9, which was a figure, there you go. Apostle Paul makes you understand that the Bible is not a history book. A Bible is figurative. Verse 9 says, which was a figure for the time, very present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices and could not make him that did a service perfect as pertaining to the conscious. Verse 10, Hebrews 9, 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So, you notice that it may surprise some people to know that the actual phrase holy of holies, although we are very familiar with it, that's how Rome can brainwash us. The holy of holies is not found anywhere in the Bible. This is the term which was apparently later adopted in history. In the scriptures, the actual phrase used, if you go there, were the most holy place or the holy place within the veil. It was called the holy place within the veil in the Bible, or the oracle, or the inner house, the most holy house, and the holy place, but not holy of holies. We adopted that along the way. So, folks, listen now. I want to tell you something. Listen to me. So, when you understood the temple like that, and what used to happen, and now putting it in our lives, you begin to understand what we talk about in this household. Nobody goes into the Holy of Holies. You notice we were read. Nobody goes into the Holy of Holies. Is the is the all essence. Listen to me. 
no one goes into the Holy of Holies. By definition, family, nobody goes there. Wait a minute. But isn't it, is it, is it, is it, is it nobody? Except the high priest. Remember, Paul says, but the high priest went there once per year. I want you to understand what I'm saying. But real, you're saying nobody goes into the high holy of holies. But the high priest went there once per year. No, I'm saying nobody goes into the holy of holies. Well, I'm confused, you would say. During Yom Kippur, the priest goes in. The high priest who goes there. And by the way, Yom Kippur, just to explain for this class, Yom Kippur is the holiest day in Jerusalem. The holiest day actually in Judaism and Samaritanism. Remember that the Jews were in two. <coughs> Pardon me. The Jews were in two parts. There was the, the, Jew, the, Judaism, the Judaism and the Samaritans. The Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were like colors. They were a mixture of the, the foreign, the non-Jews and the Jews. They were called the proselytes, I think. Yeah, but Yom Kippur is the holiest day in Judaism and Samaritanism. It occurs annually on the 10th of who? Tishri. Tishri is the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. Remember, the Hebrew calendar doesn't start from January. It starts, I think, from April. So, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, about October, that will happen. So, Yom Kippur is the oldest day in Judaism and Samaritanism. It occurs annually on the 10th of Tishri. Tishri is the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. It spells T-I-S-H-R-E-I. -E this is a class. We will define those. So, you are saying, I'm saying nobody goes into the Holy of Holies. And you say, well, I'm confused. During, you say you are confused. During Yom Kippur, a priest goes in. Well then, somebody goes in. And that's the priest, right? But I'm still telling you folks, <clears throat> nobody goes into the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> Nobody goes into the Holy of Holies. Remember, there were two chambers. The outer chamber was called Holy. We have read in the Hebrew, in Hebrews 9. And the chamber within the chamber was called the Holy of Holies, as we have adopted it, but the most holy place according to the Bible. So in the outer chamber, we saw all those ornaments. In the outer chamber, <clears throat> there was a candlestick. In the outer chamber, there was an altar and the menorah. That candlestick is called the menorah. For us to define the menorah for you, because we know you are scripture students, menorah, M-E-N-O-R-A-H. The menorah also is also sometimes you spell it as M-E-N-O-R-A. It's a multi-branched candelabra used in the religious rituals of Judaism. That has been an important symbol in both ancient, if you notice, if you wish, wish and, and modern Israel. So the seven-branched one, the, the seven-branched menorah was originally found in the wilderness sanctuary, and then later in the temple in Jerusalem, and was a popular motif of religious art in antiquity. You go that way. And then there was also an eight-branch menorah modeled after the, the temple menorah is used by the Jews in rites during the eight-day festival of Hanukkah. H-A-N-U-K-A-H. Pardon me, just give me some more. <clears throat> I want to talk to you folks. Let me and hear this will help you understand the Bible. <clears throat> so, it has the menorah, the altar, and the showbread. On the table, sorry, on the table, there was a showbread. I'll explain these things as we go on in the lessons about what the showbread was, but today there's, there's something I want to, I want to pick one area. I don't need me just close that door. Sorry. Right. So, 
the showbread, the table, and the menorah, which is the candlestick. Behind the curtain, there was the Holy of Holies. Since we will use that word, I'm using it because we are used, but it's not in the Bible. The Holy of Holies. And in that room, there was only the ark containing the Ten Commandments. You can notice, you notice that in the book of Hebrew 9. And nobody was allowed to enter the temple unless they were Kohanim. 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 No one, nobody was allowed to enter the temple unless they were Kohanim. Kohanim is K O H A K O H A N I M. Kohanim. From the priestly family. So the Behind the curtain of the holy place where was the holy of holies or the most holy place. And in that room, there was only the, the ark containing the Ten Commandments. Are we together? The ark containing the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. And nobody was allowed to go in the temple unless they were Kohanim from the priestly family. Even Kohanim were not allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. That's what I'm saying. The Bible says only Kohanim of the priestly family were allowed to enter the, 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 the Holy of Holies. Now listen to me. I want you to, to understand what I'm trying to say. Even Kohanim, the priestly family, were not allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. Only once a year at Yom Kippur, one Kohen, K-O-H-E-N, one Kohen, the high priest, Kohen is high priest in Hebrew. Only, once only a year at Yom Kippur, one Kohen, the high priest, entered the Holy of Holies. Now, I want you to, to, to see my mind. And when they came, when, they, when one Kohen came, in, he came into the Holy of Holies, he brought in a pan. He brought in, he came in with a pan of food of uh, smoking burning incense. And that signifies the prayers, right? Of the saints. He came in with a pan of smoking burning incense. He said a short prayer and backed out on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. They'll do that. You go in the Holy of Holies with a pan of smoking burning incense, said a short prayer and backed out. Um, that is that you can find when you go and read further in the book of Exodus, page 1 and 11. You can start from 28 of Exodus. You can go and study about this and then you begin to understand what it was and how the face Remember, all this is applying to you because you are the temple of the, of the Most High God. And this is Aliza, Aliko is explaining you. So Exodus 3, page 1, verse 11. Exodus, page 1, 11. Says, and the anointing oil and sweet incense, remember a pan with burning incense you went in with, and the anointing oil and sweet incense, anointing oil and sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, shall they do. You can read that in your own time, I'm just cutting out a few because of time. So, there were times, listen to me. So, no one goes into the Holy of Holies. But the priest goes there once a year. I'm saying no one goes there, including the priest. Why are you saying that, that uh, uh, Reverend and so forth? Why are you saying that? So, listen to me. You know, there were times when the high priest was in the Holy of Holies and he had an appropriate thought. That's why I'm saying no one goes into the Holy of Holies. Because even when the priest went in there, he wasn't actually there. He wasn't him. It wasn't him. Because he had no thought of himself. So there were times when the high priest was in the Holy of Holies and he had an, an, an inappropriate thought. The high priest would go in the Holy of Holies and has an inappropriate thought. Listen to me. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies with an, an inappropriate thought, he would die on the spot. That's why you notice the high priests were tied around their waist with a rope, with a chain. When he was in the Holy of Holies, 
the chair will be making noise, clean, will be making a clapping sound. Then people outside will know that he was alive inside there. So even as a priest, you could not go into the holy of holies with an inappropriate thought. You died. Because in the holy of holies, no one exists there. Even if the temple, even if the priest was there at that time, he wasn't there. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So, there were times when the high priest was in the Holy of Holies and he had, a, he had an inappropriate thoughts. He would die on the spot. So when this started happening more frequently, they instituted the custom of tying a rope or rather a chain around the Kohen's west the high priest. Because when he died in the Holy of Holies, they have a dilemma. No one is allowed to go in there and get him out. So they uttered at the rock type, or rather a chain, around the west. And if he died, they pulled him out. So what kind of inappropriate thought could the Kohen Gado? Kohen Gado is high priest. K-O-H-E-N. Kohen, then Gado, G-A-D-O-L. So I'm asking a question. What, what kind of inappropriate thought could the Kohen Gado high priest possibly have, which would make him die in the Holy of Holies. So uh, I'm saying the thing which made the high priest die in the Holy of Holies was when, was when they had inappropriate thoughts. So what kind of inappropriate thought could the Kohen Gadok high priest possibly have? Knowing that he might die, why would he have those thoughts? Remember, by the rock around his waist, how could he they could know that the cladding of the chain, when he was dead, they could hear him. So, this guy, knowing that he could die, reminded by the rope around his waist, how could he have inappropriate thought? Family, the holy of holies means, or the holy place, in simple English, the most private of private. This was God's private space. And remember, God doesn't share a space with anyone. Ezekiel says he does what seems right in his own mind. So the Holy of Holies means in simple English, the most private of private. This was God's private space. Now the Kohen Gado, the high priest, did come into that private space once a year on Yom Kippur. He, you can see that in First Peter 2.9. Now, sorry, in, in First Peter 2.9, I, I want to elaborate what the, the allegory of all this is. So the, the Kohen Gado, he came into that private space once a on Yom Kippur. And remember, in the New Testament, the Kohen Gado is you. You are a priest. Because remember, the access to the Holy of Holies, which is to the Word of God, has been granted to us. So you are the Kohen Gadol. So when you go, you don't go into the Holy of Holies. No one goes there. Even when you go there, you don't have inappropriate thoughts. You are not there, actually. God is there. The Holy of Holies is God's place, it is the most private of private. God's private space. So first Peter 2 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are a Kohen Gado priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you to be a high priest of God, you cannot have inappropriate thoughts. Because then you die. How do you die? This is kind of no, I showed you before. We die in our minds. That's why the whole religion is dead. Because they think they own God. They think they are better than others. They have inappropriate thoughts. They are going to be holy of holy with an inappropriate thoughts. We can tell by the chain around their neck, their spirit, their spirit is wrong. Their spirit stinks. So in this household, we want to pull you, to pull your dead body and resuscitate you with the truth. Don't know if this is making sense, folks. Family.
the wonderful sermon to the dead. So what was the inappropriate thought? The inappropriate thought that the Kohen had for which he died was not listen to me. The inappropriate thought that the Kohen, the, the priest, had for which he died was not when do we eat? It wasn't thoughts like when do we eat? The inappropriate thought was ego. I've showed you before, ego means eroding God out. It's an acronym. The inappropriate thought was, I'm here, it's me. It's me, I'm here. We are holier than any other church. We are holier than the next church. I'm holier than that brother. I saw that brother singing. Me, I can't sing like him. That those are, are, are inappropriate thoughts. And all of us are dead in our minds. Just like the high priest would die when he went to the Holy of Holies with inappropriate thoughts. So inappropriate thoughts was, I'm here, it's me. I can come in here. So if a priest died thinking, I'm here, I'm the best of them all. I can come in here. No one else can. I can. You will notice Paul understood that. Paul was the son of man, S-U-N of man. God gave him truth, which he never gave to most of the disciples. The truth to incorporate the Gentiles and the Jews together, the universal truth. And remember when he had to appear before the Holy of Holies, so to speak. Even me, I've been appearing before the throne of God, the Holy of Holies, is the truth. And for me to come back and teach you this way, I understand that I should not have inappropriate thoughts. Paul did not have inappropriate thoughts. You listen in the book of 2 Corinthians 12, 1, when he's talking about himself having an enlightened mind, so to speak. He's using allegories of a man going on a journey into the heaven. He's talking about himself. But he's talking about himself in a second person singular because he didn't have, want to have inappropriate thoughts. Family, the truth does not want you to have inappropriate thoughts. We are all seeing that the truth wants to, to, to occupy the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies in your body is your soul, is your mind, is your brain, because that's where the weight wants to come and sit. Now you have inappropriate thoughts. Your mind is dead. So 2 Corinthians 2. Sorry, we have lost the Zoom folks. Uh, let me see if they can come back. This is the wonderful lesson. We need to have them back. Let me just get them back. I hope this is making sense, family. If it is, you can just send me a, a, a text on Facebook to affirm. And if you want to to know more or have questions, you can still call me, call us on um, on our phone number. I think is on top of this recording. You can call us. Is uh, plus two zero plus two six zero plus two six zero nine seven seven four one five five one five plus two six zero nine seven seven four one five five one five. So we're waiting for the Zoom for family to join us again. We lost them. But we're trying to talk about how do you how do you approach truth, which is the holy of holies, the, the most holy place of, of God. No one goes there, not even the priest, not even me, but only God. It's, it's God's space. When a person goes there, they have no thought of saying, I'm here, I'm better than they are. They are not, they don't go there with inappropriate thoughts. Hi, Jane Walk. Thank you, Mwape, for bringing us back. Can we still have uh, recording rights on YouTube? Recording in progress. Awesome. So our Zoom family is back. Let's continue. This wonderful lesson. If you missed it, if you joined us late, you can still go back and listen to it. It will be on Facebook and it will be on YouTube. Don't forget to, to subscribe on YouTube and like. So the inappropriate thought that the high priest had was, here, 
I'm here, it's me. I can come in here. No one else can. I can. So I showed you that Paul, even when he received all those truths, understandings, he did not ascribe them to, to, to himself. In fact, when he's writing in 2 Corinthians 12, 1, he is speaking as though he's talking about a second person. He's using second person singular. 2 Corinthians 12, 1, he says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. It is not for him to have inappropriate thoughts, in short. You understand? So that's why it's not religion, it's not whatever you, have, you understand. What we're telling you is something different. If you're going to understand what I'm telling you, you're going to remove inappropriate thoughts. You and myself, I'm not saying, that's why for me, I, I can never say I'm holy. In fact, I always tell you, if you put all the great men in the world, me, I'll be number last. I've got nothing, I'm not there. Even me speaking to you today, don't look at me, because when you look at me, you see death. Look at God. Look at the word, the truth. You see? So it says, in Second Corinthians 12, 1, I knew a man, so Second Corinthians 12, 1, yes? It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. It's not for me to have inappropriate thoughts. I'll come to vision and revelation of the Lord. Vision and revelation, you know, allegories. Verse 2, the Bible reads, I knew a man. He's talking about himself. You hear? You understand, family? But he, he couldn't have, he's saying, it's not his business to glory for himself. So in verse 2, he's, he's speaking about himself in a selfless manner, in short. He didn't have inappropriate thoughts because this is what um, led to the killing of the high priest in the Holy of Holies when they went with inappropriate, inappropriate thoughts. Verse 2, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. He's talking about himself. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. He says, I'm not going to talk about my body. Or to say, it's me. I'm, I'm cool. I'm, I'm better than my friend. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, the holy of holy, to the truth. Remember, heaven are the scriptures. I've shown you before. You see? Verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Verse 4. How that he was caught up into paradise, into truth, into scripture, into the word, and heard unspeakable. You, you see, heaven is not a place where you can see. It, heaven are the scriptures. Remember, God is word. God is truth. Where does truth stay in the scripture? Where does God stay in the scriptures? Where, God, where does God stay in the heaven? God is word. God is truth. Truth resides in scriptures. So, it says, it says that the soul, and now that he was caught up into paradise, and the head, when he went to paradise, he didn't see, he heard, because it's a word. And heard unspeakable words, folks, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. I, I told you, it's not lawful for a man to go in the holy of holies. So it is not lawful for any of you, me and you, to learn what we are learning here with selfless, with self, with selfishness, with emotions. I want to tell you something, folks, family. It's not lawful. You cannot know God. You cannot reach God until you die to self. It's not about what you want, how you feel. That's why some of us, you see us here every day. No matter, natural occurrences don't affect the way we feel. Because it's not love. You see, it's not about how I feel. It's about, it is, it, it is about what does truth require of us. We follow truth, not our feelings, not our intu intuition or our instincts. So it was caught up into paradise and did and, and, and speakable words. Which is which it which it is not love for a man to utter. That's why he was saying I knew a man because he can't say it because it was not him. I don't know if this is making sense. Verse five of such an one I glory yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I say that I, I say the truth, but. Now I forbear. 
Lest any man should think of me above that which he sees me to be, or that is here for me. See, I don't want people to think. That's why I've never wanted anyone to think I'm the greatest, I'm better than you, I'm not family. We are here to understand this one thing. Truth has a premium. It's requiring us something that we, we can never understand it unless we remove inappropriate thoughts in our minds of I'm the best, I can be here because I came, I'm better than you. You, you see it. You, you, you committed adultery. I've never committed adultery, so I'm not on your level. It's inappropriate thoughts. But the Bible says, all are sinned. Not some, in a different way, but we all are sinners. I don't know if you're getting it. Family. <clears throat> the the seven, <clears throat> seven Corinthians 12, 7, unless I should be exalted above measure. You see, God even made sure because Paul had a lot of revelation. He, he gave him a defect in his body. And he says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Usually when God gives you a lot of things, he will create a, a, a situation which will make you look like you are nothing. It's not about you. Because you are just like any other nine, over nine billion people, if you have reached that level. We are all the same, folks. All family, all brethren, all sinners. But we all must ascribe, we must all begin to, to be having thoughts which are not inappropriate. <clears throat> so, because God does that, even me, because I know too much. But if you start looking at my life, you will find fault. Because it's not me. It's about God. Verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord Christ. Paul tried to, to, to pray for healing because he thought it was about him. No, Pastor, I'm sick. I'm going to pray for healing. You will stop everything about your life. For this thing I besought the Lord Christ that it might depart from me. Verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Because man must diminish, God must increase. You cannot go in the Holy of Holies with inappropriate thoughts, you will die. And folks, I'm here to tell you today, we are all dead, because we are all sins, we are all culprits of, of inappropriate thoughts. At some point, we, 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 we fail in the service of man. I showed you that we are honest to, to let the earth grow and be useful to man. Be in the service of another man. I said, verse 9, be most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses. That's Paul. Just like I glory in my weaknesses. That's my glory. Folks, you are better than me. Not that I'm saying it. People who have seen me and lived with me, I will treat you as such. Better than me, because that's what you are. I'm just a sinner. You see, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. That's what I do. In reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You know, my wife, who happens to be my co-host, my Mabuka, always says, why don't you return yet when people have truly wronged you? This is it. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. It's none of my business. I'm not righteous. Even the other person who has wronged me is just like me. He's an unfinished man. All I can do is pray for them, but not go and have, have, have a debate on what the, on the accusations upon me. If the accusations, if the accusations of me makes them sleep well at night, then let me give them that. But otherwise, infirmities are not my business to, to correct, to, to, to go and praise. So, they stand, therefore, I take prayer in, in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessity, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So, folks, listen, going back to what I'm trying to say. So, if you meet the Kohen Gadot, if you meet the high priest, or if you meet yourself, because remember, you are not a high priest, and say to him, hey, you are the guy who goes into the Holy of Holies. We met Paul. 
Remember, it's like we're asking Paul, hey, you are the guy who, who went into the third heaven. You are the guy who went into paradise. The Kohen Gadol will answer you and say, nobody goes into the Holy of Holies. It is the Holy of Holies. By definition, nobody goes there. That's why I cannot praise myself. Even if my brother, my friend has done a lot of things than me, I would think I'm worse than him. Because in, in praising myself, I'm going into the Holy of Holies. But nobody goes into the Holy of Holies. It is the Holy of Holies. By definition, nobody goes there. So you should say nobody, but you, you would come, probably, you would ask him, but high priest, but, but poor, yes, nobody goes in you but you. Nobody but you. He would say that, bite your tongue. He would tell you, bite your tongue. Nobody goes into the, into the Holy of Holies. So inappropriate thought for which the Kohen, the, the priest died, was the thought I come in here. I have some privilege. I have some license. I have the right to be here. You hear some people tell you, I'm most holy. If you touch me, you fall dead. You see inappropriate thoughts. If he thought that, then his presence violates the privacy of that space. When you say that, then that place is no longer private. It's yours and God's. And God's. But the Holy of Holies is a private place. It's just for God alone. Now, if you say you have the right to be there with your thoughts and your actions, then you violate the privacy of that space. It's no longer the Holy of Holies. That's why it, it cannot let you violate it. It will only kill you. Kill you. Remember, we are dead in our minds. That's why we, we will keep hating one another, not loving one another, not forgiving one another. We are dead. But the truth like this every Sunday in our house, household is helping you to revive and be that person who Paul became. Be the, the Kohen Kado who did not have inappropriate thoughts in the holy place. So nobody goes there. And even while he's there, nobody goes there. Even while he is there, even while the high priest is there, is deeply and keenly aware that it doesn't belong here. Just like me, I know I don't belong in righteousness. It's a space for God. There's no I there. There's no God, me and you. Eh? God is me and you. No, it's only God alone. The Bible says he does what his heart desires. He has no counselor. So if you say you are also part of it, then you are God's counselor. Family, I hope you're getting what I'm saying. This is very important as you begin to understand this household. As you begin to understand who we are. Because, you know, this is to stay. It's here to stay. We are already securing a place in Lusaka. We are, we are going to build a, a resource center where we'll be discussing these issues. And you are welcome to be part of it. You are welcome to support it. I've told you, I've told you several times, when you support this, you're supporting yourself because it will help you. So, that's what it was. Nobody goes there. So when he's there, he's keenly aware that he doesn't belong there. So the high priest going in there knowing that he would die, but the experience was worth it. You know, he would go in there knowing that he's a sinner, knowing that he would die, but because he knew it, it was not him, the, the eye dies. Just like when Christ had an experience of such, God gave him a, a situation where he had to choose between himself and God. The cross. Remember, he says, Father, remove this pain. But quickly he realized, no, it's not me. I'm in the Holy of Holies. Nevertheless, your will be done, not my will. So folks, family, for you to start understanding what is happening on this household, you need to reach a level where your mind and your soul, not because you're pushing it, you become, it becomes easy, comes out easy out of you. You say, it's not my will, but God's will. So it has got nothing to do with you, it has got nothing to do with me. 
Please don't come to me and say, no, Pastor, me, I'm depressed. You know, we need to pray. We need to stop preaching and just pray for me. My need to, to, to happen. No, it's the, it's the will of God which should happen. And the will of God is good. We understand that. So the high priest going in there, knowing that he would die, but the experience was worth it. The experience was two dimensional. On one hand, to be in the holy of holies, where your dead is not you. On the other hand, how could you be in the holy of holies? You, who are you? That was the, the thrilling experience of the high, high priest. To be in the holy of holies. And how can I be here, Father? I'm not worth it. You see? That was the most thrilling ex experience. So there was a joyous awe. There was a joyous awe when you begin to understand. You stand in awe of his greatness. Because it's not what you are invited to eat. You don't win a prize. Or you didn't win. You didn't do better than another friend. You didn't even do better than the mother for you to be there. You see? So we need to understand that a combination of pleasure, you know, when you begin to understand this, you begin to experience, to experience a, a combination of pleasure with the high priest felt. Combination of pleasure and the trepidation. You see? You, you, you begin to do that, to feel that. You start feeling, this is not my place. I'm way out of my league. I got. I have to do what I have to do to get it right. So God invites you to truth. Your your heart and your mind begins to melt. Your 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 ego dies out. You start saying to yourself, "This is not my place." Remember, it's for God. It's God's private place. This is this is not my place. I'm way out of my league. I got to do what I got to do and do it right. And it's incredible, but this is not my place. It's an incredible place, but it's not my place. It's for God. So that way, no matter how many young Paul he had entered, he had entered the Holy of Holies, he never compromised its sanctity. Folks, family, what I'm saying is that never compromise God's sanctity, the word of God's sanctity, the culture of God's sanctity. That's why now with this, I want to turn now to explain the sanctity of God in relationship to marriage. Because remember, God created marriage for a reason. That's why you notice he says, just like husband love your wife, just like Christ loved the church. The truth loves the people. So when you understand the sanctity of the sanctuary and never compromise it, and God has given us an exercise to do that. He's given us a privilege to do that, and that is through marriage. Every human being was ordained to be in marriage. So the same is true with intimacy with husband and wife. Just like the intimacy between God and his holy place. Listen to these folks. These are very important words. Intimacy is something God never surrenders to us. Listen to this. No, I'm in intimacy with my wife. That is, I'm talking about God's intimacy. Listen. Intimacy is something God never surrenders to us. When you understand this, you understand how to find the right person to be married to, how to, to have a peaceful and happy marriage. I'll say this again. God never surrenders to us. Intimacy, intimacy is something God never surrenders to us. He invites us to experience it, but never own it. God invites us to experience intimacy between him or intimacy. Even your intimacy between you and your wife is not yours. God invites you to experience it and you never own it. We never have privileges when it comes to intimacy. Please listen, I'm slow now. And that's why inappropriate intimacy is a violation of the West kind. Like killing, like killing, you know, like a mother, like killing, God never, never gave us control over life. Remember, 
in the case of killing, we understand that God never gave us control of our life. That's why killing is wrong. We don't care. It doesn't matter if we are trying to secure the sovereign of Russia that it's expedient some Ukrainian should die. No. God never gave us control of our life. God never gave us control. This God never gave us control over intimacy. So when we abuse intimacy, it's like abusing the temple. Get me right. If we abuse it's like abusing the temple. Remember, God killed the priest. That's why you are dead in your mind. It was never yours. Intimacy is not yours. In older days, you know, things have changed, folks. Family, that's why you need households like this. In older days, in olden days, people were very familiar with sacred things. People understood, they knew how to respect sacred things. People were familiar with sacred things. For example, a holy book. People fear that. Remember, intimacy is sacred. The temple is sacred. And I'm telling you that in the old days, people were, who were very familiar with sacred things. A holy book. The people knew that you don't choose a holy book to prop, us, to prop up a chair, to prop as a chair. You wouldn't get a holy book and sit on it uh, as a chair. They knew how sacred things were. A holy book, you couldn't use it as a chair. It's a holy book, a holy place. It was a synagogue. There was a Torah in there. There was an ark. There were holy, you know, we had things like holy days. People understood holy. And so when you sat down with this could say young group, those days when you are counseling people who are fixing to get married, you sat down with a young group or the young bride, and you said that the intimacy that you are going to have with your spouse is holy. You're telling these two couple trying to marry. You tell them the intimacy you are going to have together is holy. They knew what you are talking about because they understood holy. They understood the holy Bible. They, they understood the holy days. They understood the holy things. So if, when you told them the intimacy you are having to, together is holy, they knew what you were talking about. Now things have gone just to trash. That was familiar. Today is not so familiar. So when we come to the young couple and admonish them to treat the relationship appropriately, and remind them that it's sacred thing and that they, they, they have to act with certain sanctity. They have to act with certain sanctity. They don't know what that means now. They ask you, what's sacred? No, people don't know what's sacred anymore. So family, let me tell you this for you to understand what I'm trying to say. So the body is not yours. Hear me good. The body is not yours. Your wife is not yours. Please listen. I want you to understand. The body is not yours. The wife is not yours. When we get comfortable with those two ideas, then we can start to understand that intimacy also is not yours. Have to return it in, you see? Your wife is not yours. Your children are not yours. Your wife is not yours. Do you understand? When you get comfortable with these two, two things, two things, the body is not yours and your life is not yours. 
you get comfortable with these, those two things, two ideas, then we can start to understand that intimacy also is not yours. So there are three things, rather, that don't belong to us. Three things which do not belong to us. My life is not mine, one. My body is not mine, two. I have to retain it in as good the condition as I can. That's why you can just put drugs, pierce the body, do all sorts of things to the body. It's not yours. You have to retain it in as good the, the good condition as you can to the owner. So three things, my life is not mine, my body is not mine, my wife is not mine. Not in the sense of ownership. Hear me both. Don't pick up smoke. Not in the sense of ownership. So when I say my wife, I mean the woman. When I say my wife is not mine, I mean the woman to whom I'm responsible, not the woman I own. I don't own Mam Lumbuka, my co-host here. She is the woman to whom I'm responsible for. So when I say my wife, I mean the woman to whom I'm responsible, not the woman I own. I hope you're getting the, the difference. The same is true with my children. The children don't belong to you. Your children means the children you are responsible for. The same is true with intimacy. Your intimacy means the intimacy for which you are responsible for. But yours, you possess it, you have the right to, no, never. It's sacred. All these things are sacred. And people must be, we must begin to teach people to respect sacred. There's another aspect to the sanctity of marriage. I'm speaking to someone, I guess, today, to some people. There's another aspect to the sanctity of marriage. Two people get together. They love each other, and they decide to get married. Listen! Two people get together. They love each other, and they decide to get married. There is no more ridiculous idea than that. That is ridiculous. Two people get together. They love each other, and they decide to get married. There is no more ridiculous idea than that. I love you. I love you too. Okay, let's get married. I love you. I love you too. Okay, let's get married. There's no logic in there. I love you. You love me. Therefore, let's get married. Who is the logic? Who invented this idea that if you love each other, you get married? If you love each other, you have to get married. So, are you saying that's the price you pay to love? Is that the price you pay for love? Is that your punishment for falling in love? It's the same as saying, I love you, and you love me. Then, let's pick up the next good town and live there. That's what you're saying. I love you, you love me. Let's go and live in Osaka, or let's go and live in Kabul. No logic. Who said love and marriage go together like a horse and a carriage? A horse and a carriage go together, but love and marriage don't. Hear me good. I don't see the comparison, that's all. It works the other way. Let me tell you what marriage is, not according to me. Remember, I recite truth. I recite the scriptures. Marriage is the only way that God wants us all to live. You hear me? Marriage is the only way that God wants us all to live. So, what your thinking should be is, if I love you and you love me, then we can make a marriage together. Not let's get married, no. Then we can make a marriage together. Not because we love each other. Because being married, Remember, marriage is the only way that God wants us to live, all of us. So, because being married is sacred. And that's what we should be. So, it, it works like this. Before I find out how much, whether you love me, or how much you love me, the first thing I need to know is that, do you love marriage? 
I'm thinking about what God wants the world to, to be marriage. So if you meet someone, you have to know, do they love marriage? Not because they love you and you love them, let's get married. No, no, do they love marriage? So if you are going out, if you are going out to find your soulmate, the first thing you should say is that I love marriage. Do you? I'm talking about God's culture, not human culture, not Western culture. If the answer is yes, then okay, we should continue our conversation. You meet someone, you teach your young girls. Sorry, sorry for inconvenience, sir. Uh, for the Zoom session, we are going with less than 10 minutes. For the second session, to uh, come to an end. Thank you. All right, thank you, man. So that's what we should do. If you're going to face, if you are, if you are going out to find your soulmate, the first thing you should say is that I love marriage. Do you? If the answer is yes, then okay, we should continue our conversation. Since we both love marriage, maybe we could do this together. You understand? Since we both love marriage, maybe we do wish we could do this together. Maybe we can make the marriage between the two of us. But the reason you get married is not because you love her. The reason you get married is because you love marriage. Yes. And if she loves marriage as much as you do, you are in luck. Go for it. Do it because the objective is marriage, not love. Love is human. And remember, the way you feel about your friend changes every second. That's why we say marriage is the choice. Today I'm adding this phrase, love is human, marriage is divine. That's the motto you should have even when you're married to wife. Love is human, marriage is divine. That's what God wants us to be, married. Marriage is sacred. So two people love each other. They decide to, 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 to get married. Listen to this. Two people love each other. They decide to, to get married. They live happily ever after. Are you getting me? Two people love each other. They get they decide to get married. They live happily ever after. This this was a successful union. It was not a successful marriage. 99% of the human family are just in union, not marriage. This was a successful union. As some of you are coming from successful or failed unions, but you need to find a marriage. And the marriage you find your soulmate. The assignment idea is not just a fairy tale, it's a fact. So, the people get, decide to get together and get married and they live happily ever after. This was a successful union, it was not a successful marriage, because unless there were two parts of the same soul reuniting through marriage, then their relationship is just a good partnership. You hear me? It's a good arrangement, not a marriage. A marriage is the reuniting of two souls which were torn apart at creation, so to speak. So it's just a good arrangement, not a marriage. So by definition, family, marriage means not a union. Please, don't follow what religion tells you. Marriage means not a union between two people, but a reunion of a single soul that has gotten divided. So when you say that I am looking for my soulmate, that's not a poetic sentiment. It's true. You marry your soulmate. The other part, of, you marry the other part of your soul. Now when two parts of the soul find each other, that's marriage. Because it's a reunion. But an arrangement between two people, that's not a marriage. And that's what we have, arrangements between two people. And that's why Folks, an arrangement, listen to this part carefully because this is happening also in our country. An arrangement between two people, that's not a marriage. And that's why you can't have a marriage between two men. Listen to me. You can't have a marriage between two men. But you can have a union between two men and you can have, and, and you, you can live happily ever after. It's not a marriage because it's, it's, it's not a reunion. It's not even advisable. 
to have a marriage between persons of different. Listen to me. Let me say it again. Two men marry each other. It's not a marriage. It's, it, it's probably a union. And people have lived happily ever after. But it's not a marriage. That's not what God wants. I'll add also on top. It's not even advisable to have a marriage between persons of different cultures. Because it's a union. And not a reunion. Unless you both begin to learn similar cultures. Don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So what makes marriage sacred is the soul marriage. It's the wholeness of soul. That's heavy holy stuff. No, I'm talking about heavy holy stuff. For you to go and marry in another couch, it's a union. It might work, but it's a union. But for you to be so many, I think you must have similar culture, similar understanding of things. That's why, uh, anyway, I know that that's heavy for this stuff. That's why once you marry, you know without a doubt that this is the other part of your soul because there are no mistakes when two persons, two persons who live in truth are married. Listen to me, I went so slow on that. Let me say it again. That's why once you're married, you know without a doubt that this is the other part of your soul. Because there are no mistakes. When two persons who live in truth, that's what I'm saying, truth must be the anchor of the, all the human race. So there is no mistake. That's why once you marry, you know without a doubt that there is, that without the doubt that this is the other part of your soul, because there are no mistakes when two persons who live in truth are married. They know they are of the same soul. They know they were meant to be. It was destined from the beginning of creation and there are no mistakes. What happens? So now what happens? This ideal marriage I'm talking about. What happens if this marriage ends up in divorce? You know what happens when true marriage of soulmates end up in divorce? then you divorce your soulmate. And now, how do you do that? See, the suggestion that if your marriage does, does not work out, then you are married to a wrong person cannot be in a true marriage. Isn't it? So sometimes, isn't it possible that you make a mistake, but you have the same culture of the same truth? Isn't it possible that you made a mistake? Yes! You made a mistake, but God doesn't. You thought he was what you thought he would be. Yes, that was your mistake, but God caused that. God caused you to be in that mistake so that you could get married to that person. But if you have the same truth, it will work. That way, that may be why some marriages are really stressful. Stressful marriages does not mean they should divorce. If they are in truth, they can be brought to life. Because the souls are compatible. The souls I'm talking about is your mind. This is not the same truth. It's compatible. The souls need to be together and that's heavy stuff for a human being to handle. So sometimes it's so... Sorry, we, the Zoom folks have gone out. So Zoom folks... We are only remaining with a short while also here. You can join us on Facebook as we wind up. So that's why I'm saying some marriages are stressful because the souls are compatible. The souls need to be together and that's heavy stuff for a human being to handle. So sometimes it's so heavy that you can't ex expect them to handle it. So who invented divorce? You know, it's sometimes it's so heavy for them to handle it. And you can't ex ex expect them to handle it. So who invented divorce? God. God said, I need you to be married to this person. But if it's really difficult for you, I'm not going to force you. I'll tell you how to get out. I'll tell you how a divorce works. But who are you divorcing? Because if you divorce your soul, you divorce your part of your soul.
Remember, I'm, I'm trying to recite the Bible. I'm, I'm saying, Christ would say, because of your hardness of heart, he gives you a view of divorce, you can go and read all those. So, the question is, who are you divorcing? That's why it's, it's not advisable to divorce among people who, who are in the same truth, who live in the same truth, because that marriage can be salvaged. Folks, there are no potential soulmates. Soulmate means the person you are destined to marry. Sometimes you might not be, you might, your hand might not be in it. You might be, God can bring them to you by accident. And you might not see it. That doesn't mean you, you need to divorce them. That's why you need to be among people who need truth, who will nurture you and guide you into your happiness in that marriage, no matter how it started. We all have soulmates. And at, at the, at the right time, at the right moment, you might not have a hand in this sometimes, you will meet your soulmate. Folks, I know I've talked so much about this. I hope this makes sense and it will help you. Like I said, this is the household too. We come to talk about truth, which is going to bring man to his intended self. Man, when I say man, I'm talking about every time I echo this, the four type of man. White, black, yellow, brown. White, the Caucasians, yellow, the Chinese and the others. Black, Africans, brown. Jews, Indian, everyone. The message is for all of us. It's not a religious message. It's a message which is going to emancipate man. And if you join us late, you can go back to these recordings on YouTube. When you go to YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe and like, or you can read this same brief again on Facebook, it will, it will remain safe there. I think for me, from my end, this is what I have. If you have a question, please call us. The number is plus 2609774155. So from this time, I know we have pushed through the time I'll ask my course to say something. Please take your time, don't rush. Summarize, because sometimes, no, I speak you tell me that some of the things, sometimes, sometimes I speak like an, like an academic but I know what you mean is, is that uh, I speak with authority. Not authority of pushing people. I speak truth, because whoever is speaking truth, truth is the authority God puts on man to follow his will. So, Mamumbuka, pick it up. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And, um... It was a very, very um, powerful talk. Uh, really, really appreciate. Um, yeah. So just to give a very short summary to what you've been, what you've taken us through today. Um, I think you began by, before you got into the meat of the of the talk, you began by admonishing us that the there's no there should be no compulsion. In religion but what we see uh, in religion is you are compelled to do something but that should not be so they sh they should there shouldn't be any fear or compulsion in doing something and so you also reminded us what um, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit uh, means um, I think you took us through Matthew 12 verse 31 where uh, Christ was saying all oh, other sins can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the only sin that um, is, is unforgivable. And you mentioned to us that this signifies when the Son of Man brings the word and we don't pay an ear to the word, basically what we're doing, we're blaspheming the truth. And you reminded us that the word is the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son, and the three are one. So later on, you began then to talk about what you, what the aspect today was all about which is the temple of god and you took us to a series of scriptures but basically you 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 were showing us what paul was trying to um uh, to reveal on the allegory of the word or rather the temple of god using um the old testament and how the new testament in hebrews basically he he, he paul explained uh, that allegory in relation to us today. So, um, according to Hebrews 9, verse 1, I think Paul 
wrote a series of scriptures or verses there where he was he explained um the temple of god using um the chambers basically the the, the two chambers and the first one uh was um the holy place which is basically a sanctuary which is known as a sanctuary where we saw that there were candlesticks there was um the table there with the showbread and so that was known as the holy place and then there was a veil which led into the inner court or the inner uh, or the, the the holy the most holy place which we refer to as the holy of holies but like you said in scripture it's actually not the holy of holies it's supposed to be known as the the most holy uh place which was uh where the ark was found and which was uh, where the golden altar was also found where the burning of incense used to happen and so um you you took us through the trying to basically explain what that means and what it is today and so you mentioned to us that nobody goes in the most holy place and that's how come we see in in you know in the times uh, that paul was trying to refer to where only the high priest used to go there but even then it's not him it's he still didn't used to go there and then later on you explain to us what that means and so you mentioned to us that according to judaism the ancient times judaism samaritism um this used to happen once a year the the, the holy priest um used to go in there once a year and this used and 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 basically this uh this person used to be called the kohan which is the priest from the priestly family or of the priestly family so this was the only person that was allowed to go there but you later on you explain to us what that means as well and and this used to happen in the seventh month of the jewish calendar or the hebrew um calendar and so you showed us that in the holy the, the, there were two chambers of course like, like you mentioned the holy place as well as the most um holy place the holy place that's where you had the showbread the altar the candlestick the table and also you had the multi-branch uh, rather you you also had um a veil which led into the most holy place where only the ark was found which contained the ten commandments and so um no one was allowed to go there and except the the, the kohan uh kador who was the, of the priestly family yeah so basically he brought in there um the smoke the the the, the pan of uh, smoking burning incense which was signifying the prayers of the saints but also you explained to us when Paul emphasized the fact that nobody really goes there so even when the high priest went in there it was not about him he was not permitted to have inappropriate thoughts or inappropriate thoughts he was not permitted to have ego because it was all about god yeah so even if he was there he himself as him was not there so that's what paul was saying nobody actually goes there and so um the allegory there is that we are not uh even now um we are not allowed to go into the most holy place and so you explained a bit further what that meant and so what we see is that there was a chain that was tied around the west because if at all he went in there and he had an inappropriate thoughts he basically he died instantly so the only way they our present day like paul was trying to explain uh, according to first peter 2 9 the bible talks about us being uh, a chosen generation a holy priesthood so which means that that uh kodan kado in this new testament is actually us we are we are that priest and so um well, that signifies our minds because the word of god dwells there and that's the most holy place 
where God uh, dwells. So we are not allowed to have inappropriate thoughts, which is an ego. Here, inappropriate thoughts would symbolize uh, what the priest, the inappropriate thought that the priest was not allowed to have was an ego, which is eroding God out. Basically, when that happens, what we see is that we die. And that death is the death of the mind. Yeah. And you mentioned to us some time back, I think, in Proverbs, where the Bible says that he who dwells in the congregation, he who lacks understanding dwells in the congregation of the dead. So that death, even today, is the death of the mind. Yeah. So Paul basically understood that very deeply. And he... In Second Chronicles 12, he spoke of a second person singular where he was caught up into paradise and heard the unspeakable words, which was not lawful for him to, to utter. And he was basically trying to say that uh, you cannot reach God until you die to self. He could not boast of, of that experience that he had, which is the experience of the deep understanding of the word. He could not boast of that because that meant that self is what, you know, he put self before God. But for us to really reach God, you mentioned to us that there has to be a death to self, a death to an ego, a death to lust, and a death to selfish desires. Yeah. So, and also we see that in order for Paul not to be proud, he was given a thorn in the flesh. And so he begged God three times to take away, uh, take away that thorn in the, in the flesh. But the Bible says that he was told that my grace is sufficient for you. And so he spoke of how he 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 takes pleasure in infirmities, and and for Christ's sake. Why? Because when when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Yeah. So he took us back again to the understanding that nobody goes into the most holy place because it is not it is not him because that will be an inappropriate place or an inappropriate thought. Yeah. So even when the priest went into the most holy place, he understood that um, even when he goes there, it is not about him, but it's about God. And so he does what he, God does what he wills, and he has no counselor. He, and, and therefore, uh, if at all the priest was able to go in there, then he can counsel God, but God has no counselor. And so um, the going into the most holy place uh, for the priests, that was an experience, that, it was a high experience and a privilege that they didn't take lightly. And so even us today, you reminded us that we need to reach a level where we need to die to self, uh, not our will, where we are able to say, not my will, but God's will be done. Yeah. And also you mentioned to us that God invites us to the most holy place, but it's not about us. It's not about, it's, it's not our place. It's a place for God. It's a place where we, our self, that self part of us dies. And I think later on, as you were getting towards the uh, end of the session, you reminded us never to compromise the culture of God's sanctity. The word of God. um, and never to compromise the word of God's sanctity. And I think you, you, you mentioned to us that in the olden uh, ancient times, um, people or the generation then understood sacred things. They understood what it means when something was sacred, when something was, was, was holy. And so when you speak about intimacy, it's something that you mentioned that God's intimacy is something God never surrenders to us. He invites us to experience it, but not to own it. So when it comes to intimacy, we have privileges. We, we never have privileges. That is why violation of, of it is very painful. And for me, this uh, it, it was quite uh, you know, crucial to understand because what we are seeing now is a sense of, more like a sense of privilege to what really does not belong to us. Because if God says this is sacred, this is this is this is mine, but the moment we take ownership of it, that's how come now we are seeing people feeling like they can do what they want to do because they feel it belongs to them. You know, I can I get up today and say I can marry somebody of the same sex because I feel this intimacy is mine, I feel my body is mine, I feel I own it. So for me that was very 
crucial for us to really understand. And, and just what you say that God never gave us control over another life, when we abuse it, it's like abusing the temple. So this is our temple. And so intimacy is sacred and it's, it's never ours. Um, then you also mentioned to us that the fact that people in those in the ancient times understood sacred things, they understood the temple being sacred, the holy book being sacred, you know, the synagogue, they basically feared sacred things, you see. And that's why um, even then when couples, maybe young couples were told that this intimacy is sacred and it's holy, they took it that way. But I guess now it's different from what we are seeing um, nowadays. Yeah. And you reminded us that there are three things that do not belong to us, our, our life, our bodies, our spouses. And I think here you, you made it clear that it's a sense of, or it's a sense of that I own this. That should not, that's what it should not be. It shouldn't be that way, okay? But that we should be responsible over what we own. So meaning we are seeing, I, I understood it as when you understand the sense of responsibility over something, you will not violate it, you will not abuse it you will not misuse it because you are responsible over it and you don't essentially own it. Yeah, so I think that was very, very critical to understand. And I think you took us through some, you know, some insights on what marriage is and, and um, that is the only way that God wants us to live. Why? Because it's, it's divine. It's something sacred. It's a, it's, it's, it's actually a, two souls that live in truth coming together and it's not about a union as we see it in a worldly perspective but we but it's actually a sacred a, a true marriage is sacred it's reuniting of two souls that were torn apart at creation and the wholeness of these souls is what is what makes it sacred so just like what you mentioned that there's no mistake when two people who live in truth um, marry and, and re, the, the souls reunite. Yeah. And you also mentioned to us, you, you, you mentioned a little bit on what the implication of a divorce between those two people who live in truth, whose souls are united in the sanctity of marriage. And it essentially means divorcing a part of your soul. Basically, a part of your soul goes away. And so you reminded us, and I think this for me brought a lot of hope that there is a soulmate for everybody. And so soulmate means the person you are destined to marry and that person exists for everyone. And at the right time, um, if you live in truth and they live in truth, you will be able to, um, to reunite. Yeah, so this explained, yeah. I think this was um, more of a, um, just magnifying the concept of what sac sanctity is and holding sacred uh, the holy things and one of them which is marriage. Yeah, Thank you so much. Awesome. That's it, folks. Family, you heard, you heard the, sub the summary is awesome and clear. We thank you for being with us again. We are always thankful. This is the family, your family. We are not righteous no better than you but we are people who are pursuing righteousness people who do not have inappropriate thoughts we are people who are learning who are growing to be without ego eroding god out of our lives we are people who want to experience the holy of holies without inappropriate thoughts this was very awesome you know if i can put a title to this there are many titles but maybe the best title is the sanctity of marriage I don't know what my host would call it. What would you call it, love? I'll I'll still call it the temple of God, and uh, and 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 the sacred things. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think you because you touched quite a lot a lot of aspects, and marriage came in where you used it to explain one of the sacred things and trying to understand how we should hold dear the sacred things. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, family. You're welcome. Maybe Sunday, 9.30 to 11. 
you're welcome to this. Like, like I said, we are establishing ourselves now. We are, we are already acquiring a place where we want to create, to build a resource center where everyone is welcome to come and experience the holy of holies, the holy place. And of course, it only comes with one premium, no inappropriate thoughts. Because no one is righteous. We can't even say we are better than anyone. We just a people who are trying to do right uh, and the people who are trying to do what if the whole world did this, then we're going to have peace in the world. Thank you very much. We'll see you next Sunday again. You're welcome to this. You're welcome to subscribe to, to our YouTube channel. We love you. God bless you. Goodbye.